Birmingham. It was one of a series of bombings in the Birmingham area during the late 50s and early 60s, and it was never solved. Last month, the grand jury began a new investigation of the bombings and yesterday indicted two men. One was Robert Chambliss of Birmingham, a former Ku Klux Klan member. Chambliss, jailed last night, is being held without bond on four counts of first-degree murder. His attorney says Chambliss is innocent. My reaction, of course, is going to depend upon our investigation. We intend to plead not guilty. Investigators won't reveal the name of the second person indicted until the arrest warrant is served, but say more indictments are expected. This is the beginning. We'll be using, uh, hopefully, each grand jury from now on trying to present evidence of a series of bombings which took place in the Jefferson County, Birmingham area in the 1950s and early 60s. It's been reported that the second person indicted is J.B. Stoner, a Georgia attorney and self-proclaimed white supremacist. The grand jury's investigation of Stoner reportedly links him to one of several bombings of the Bethel Baptist Church. Judy Elfenbein for NBC News in Birmingham. Uh, this would be a great tourist attraction, not only for the handicap in the city and county of Montgomery, but throughout the state and nationwide, people coming in to look at all the other historical places, such as the capital, that we have in Montgomery. And we just contend that this would be a big step forward for the city of Montgomery and for the state if we could promote making the Riverfront Park totally accessible to the handicap. From, from the tunnel, uh, whether it's a ramp and steps, uh, whether it's an elevator, or what have you. But we contend that, you know, sure, the railroad tracks are not easy to maneuver in coming over the alternate route that we have. From a wheelchair standpoint, our person on crutches or braces or what have you. And we contend that we're not asking for something that is outrageous. We're asking for just uh, an equal chance to prove that it, you know, it can work, and, and we know that it can. It's worked in other cities and other states, and it can work in the city of Montgomery. We are trying to go through the channels, uh, through the enforcing agencies uh, that we feel might help us uh, uh, get the park and the tunnel made accessible uh, and so we're at this point we you know have decided uh, on the suit we're just trying to wait and we're trying to get the uh, made accessible voluntarily and of course this is what we would like to do we don't wouldn't like to force anybody to do something they don't want to do we like to see people do something because they like to do it because they want to help people and uh, give the handicapped people an equal opportunity to enjoy the facilities down here that the able-bodied people enjoy. The city, however, contends the park can be enjoyed by handicapped as well as able-bodied persons. A.R. Emery Farmer says accommodations were included in the design to accommodate handicapped persons. Among these provisions, Farmer says, are parking spaces at the entrance to the park reserved strictly for the handicapped. And Farmer says a turnaround has been built at the bottom of the hill leading up to the riverboat, which would allow handicapped persons to be let out of their vehicles and have easy access to the remainder of the park. As for the steps leading up to the riverboat itself, Farmer says that is being worked on. So at least for the time being, the city seems satisfied with its position on the park, a position some handicapped persons say could be costly. This is Dave Rickey, WSFAE TV News, Riverfront Park. Fill the building, issue revenue bonds, build a building, and then lease it back to the county. Now they face the same problems with bonding office space. And this is something that you might want to look into because reasonable estimate things that I want to make clear to you are it's something that uh, you can be, uh, know what is available and if it strikes a uh, chord, go after it more intensely. That's very hard. Well, of course, the first step of this, uh, any uh, new building 
that the county may undertake in the future, you had to have this study in our opinion, so that's the reason we've been studying this for six months, these people have, and they've issued their final report today, which was very interesting, which any architectural firm will have to have in order to uh, coordinate all this space and the future space requirements. So hopefully now, the uh, obviously, the next step is to uh, get some dough. And I mean a lot of dough, because we're talking about 17, 18 million dollars for new jail, new court facilities, etc. in addition to what we already have. How are things progressing with the land that the county recently purchased across the street? Well, we uh, immediately had the uh, trees tore down and uh, cleaned the uh, buildings cleaned off. And in the interim, while we were raising the money, and uh, as an ongoing project, we're going to uh, blacktop that over there and utilize for juror parking and, uh, and uh, excess visitor parking, et cetera, et cetera, that's badly needed when people, as they know, when they come to the courthouse. So we'll use that land, get some use out of it now. Providing the political atmosphere is favorable, the study has not completely ruled out the possibility of a city-county jail, nor for that matter, any other type of joint venture. Chairman McKinney has urged the Montgomery City County Consolidation Committee to wrap up their business by the first of the year so that some definite steps can be taken as soon as possible to relieve not only the jail but county government as a whole from a long-standing case of overcrowding. Bill Weaver, WSFA TV News. We well know what the benefits uh, are that might accrue from such a, a facility, particularly in securing the evidence that is on and in the body uh, that has been found dead for one reason or another. And the question arises, for what reason and how? And that must be determined. And in order for that to be determined, it requires the cooperation of a number of agencies working closely together with the ultimate objective of one thing, namely securing and making the most of the physical evidence that is available uh, following the incident itself, following that through and giving testimony in a court of law regarding these findings. had asked for safety to be covered in his injunction, but nowhere in his injunction did he cover the safety of safety the Safety for what? Safety of the employees, safety in their family and their property because of the fact that 
if someone would deliberately do something to that property or to them, uh, we felt that it was a safety factor while we was out, and that's why we remained out. And But he issued an injunction for us to go back to work, and we are following the injunction, but, but we certainly want relief for the safety factor in the injunction. So what will your next step be? Well, the next step will be to seek that relief for the safety factor of the workers, and I, I think that is beyond anything else that we can do. In what manner will you try to achieve that? Well, we will try to have the preliminary injunction lifted to the extent, to, uh, either lifted or that it will include a measure of safety factor. I, I just hope that uh, the people understand that this was not a sympathy strike or not a slowdown or work stoppage. This was a strike that we wanted protection for our families, our property, and our, ourselves uh, on and off the job because in these kind of matters, I think you need them. Has a decision been made for sure that a bridge will be built? Uh, this is step number one. Uh, this pretty well commits ourselves to ultimately building it. How much difference is there between the different sites that the Highway Department has proposed? Practically the, no difference in cost, very little. And what kind of response have you received so far? We've had excellent response. Uh, we had a meeting at 10 this morning, and this one this afternoon. We'll have another one at 7 tonight. And how is there any way to tell which alternative the people, most of the people are in favor of? Uh, at this stage, it seems like they're about uh, evenly divided. How much will this weigh on the, the Highway Department's final decision? Uh, it'll, we, we'll consider it. Uh, uh, It'll have a, it'll carry a lot of weight with, with the ultimate decision. And Oliver's taken away from Epstein. And Oliver struck him. <coughs> struck item number 20. Without the corrections. Ms. Williamson. I move the uh, <coughs> acceptance of the minutes. The minutes is corrected in discussion. All in favor of the motion. Signify by raising your hand. Unanimous. Motion carries. Fourth, which is still an unacceptable tolerance. However, that is down from some of the highs that we had several weeks ago. Intensive pressure still on us, but uh, I do point those out to you. Did everybody get a copy of it? Need to change, and this is item 
number 20. I think the um, neighborhood and the silhouette of the neighborhood and other things would be. There was two operations last night resulting in one in the last of the massage parlors being closed down, the Oasis. Uh, at the Oasis there were uh, two male operators and three female operators and the operator of the massage parlor itself were brought to headquarters. Charges are being considered and pending against these individuals for operating a massage parlor without a license. The owner of the massage parlor was also brought to headquarters and charges are being considered and pending against her. Also in the, in the same vein, a local bonding official was arrested last night uh, following, a, a, following a lengthy investigation of prostitution in and around Montgomery. Uh, he was arrested and charged with attempting to bribe a police officer. There are two other outstanding warrants for two other people in connection with this attempted bribery of a police officer in regards to prostitution in Montgomery. Also at a local truck stop last night, in conjunction with a, a homicide investigation that's being conducted by the detective division, several procurers and prostitutes were picked up at that location and brought to headquarters last night in regards to this investigation. So what the point I want to make is that even though prostitution may seem innocent to some people, it has other effects that are, that are tied to it, that being bribery of, of attempted bribery of public officials. And in this case, at, uh, at the local truck stop, there's an implication that prostitution has, has played a part in a homicide or other homicides in this city. Warrants on the two Birmingham men say that the bribery attempt took place here at this Montgomery nightclub on September 11th. And we are told the deal was sealed when both men put 45 caliber pistols to the head of the police officer and told him he would be shot and killed if he double-crossed them. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News reporting.
Thank you, John. Good morning, gentlemen. And ladies, if there are any present. <clears throat> we have been knowing for months that huge increases in taxes would be forthcoming. It is now a reality. It's now a reality in Montgomery County. Reappraisal notices have been mailed, and the results are no less than shocking. The lid bill is a simple solution to a very complex tax situation. It keeps the county's total property tax revenue from increasing more than 20% over the previous year. We aren't asking that taxes be in, uh, decreased. We are simply asking that the increase be limited to 20%. Another important provision of the bill is valuing property at its current use rather than its highest speculative use. A person who lives near a business or operates a farm near one, for example, should not be required to pay taxes as if it were used for a business. It should be taxed for what it is being used and not for what it could be used. The lid bill has twice been passed by the House of Representatives and has twice been blocked from coming up for a vote in the Senate. The lid bill is a constitutional amendment and must be ratified by a vote of the people before becoming a law. And we trust that the legislature will give the opportunity to the people to vote on this most important issue of this dramatic increase in property taxes. Now, why should Farm Bureau be interested in this issue? Well, we, there are many, and I'll summarize these quickly in the interest of your time. But there is considerable property in Alabama belonging to farmers, and therefore we are interested. Uh, we have substantially all of the farmers in the state in our membership. But in addition to that, Farm Bureau has a mandate in the public sector as a public organization, a volunteer membership organization, to the remainder of the state. And in fact, our charter specifies clearly that it is our duty to work in the interest of the economic improvement of Alabama, the social improvement of Alabama, and the educational improvement of the citizens of this state. Bud made a recommendation that we establish another position, and that's what we do, we've done. I think it will be very helpful to, this, to the authority. Now, if Mr. Miller is running the Housing Authority, why do you need another person, another job? Well, of course, we will have another position, and, and uh, uh, that, that per, uh, position will be the person who will be responsible for the activities and the personnel of the, uh, and as well as coordination with all of the federal, state, and local agencies. It's just a big job, and that will free Mr. Miller to work more directly with management and with maintenance problems that we have. I think you could base it on the fact that it's a lot of changes going to be made in the Housing Authority over the next few months. Uh, I think we have already in the last two months started making some of these changes uh, in, in different areas and uh, I think the board has discussed it with some of the administration and feel like that this might be the, the best way to go by appointing a new head of the overall Housing Authority rather than trying to restructure part of uh, the administration possibly that's already there. Well, I think that is evident that um, the action that was taken was unanimous by the board and that this will give us the leadership that we need, uh, establishing a position throughout the state, a uh, position of this nature, managing housing authorities, uh, this particular number, the position pay a salary comparable to what we have approved here today by the board. Is the board satisfied with the way Mr. J.C. Miller is running the housing authority? I would reserve comment on that at this particular time. The big flap over family court judge John Davis's role in the Wallace divorce story up until this point has been aimed specifically at Judge John Davis. But there are other things to consider in this controversy. First, Mrs. Wallace's attorneys want Judge Davis to recuse or excuse himself from hearing the case because Davis was appointed to the bench by Governor George C. Wallace and Judge Davis's father and father-in-law had been associated with business and other areas with Governor George C. Wallace. 
But according to courthouse observers, there are other judges on the Montgomery bench that also hear divorce cases, and four out of the six on the bench here in this county were appointed by Governor George C. Wallace before winning election to their respective benches. They are Circuit Court Judges Richard Emmett, Judge Randall Thomas, and Judge Sam Taylor. They are Wallace appointees, and if the case had been before those judges, our observers say the same kinds of charges now surrounding Judge Davis could possibly have been made. Mrs. Wallace's attorneys could possibly have approached Judge Joseph Phelps to take the case. He is a former law partner of Albert Brewer, a strong Wallace political enemy. Had that occurred, the crime might have been that by his association with a known Wallace political enemy, that Phelps should recuse himself. Then Republican Judge Perry Hooper, had he been sitting on the case, could have been accused of being a Wallace enemy because of his party affiliation. In 1970, there was a case similar to this. The late Judge William Thetford was sitting on a divorce case. He was asked to recuse himself by one of the attorneys. There was a lot of pressure. Judge Thetford recused himself from the case. But then the state Supreme Court othered the judge back on the bench and said to him that they saw no reason why he should recuse himself. There had been a lot of unpleasant things said about it. The court said, never mind that, that it was his duty to sit on that case no matter how unpleasant it was as long as he was competent to hear the case. This might just be the case with Judge Davis. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News at the Montgomery County Courthouse.